Okay, good morning. We're going to get started here to keep on track. So for those of you who, who don't know us, we are the Center for Cardiovascular Investigations at the University of Guelph. And we represent uh, colleges and departments all across the university. So we are the Ontario Veterinary College, the College of Biological Sciences, Biomedical Sciences, Clinical Studies, Pop Med, Molecular and Cell Biology, Human Health and Nutritional Sciences, Integrative Biology, and collectively the faculty you see on the picture here represent uh, the different labs involved in CCBI. Okay. So we run a number of different seminar series. These are the cardiovascular seminar series. And the purpose of uh, these seminars are on the slide here. So the first is we want to promote the outstanding research of our faculty. A lot of us go to places nationally and internationally to present, but we don't get an opportunity here to hear about what we do. And so part of the purpose of this seminar series is to promote our research. It facilitates networking for graduate students, so students involved in cardiovascular or other research that are interested in getting involved can come see what it is that we do in our labs and reach out. And we also want to attract the best and brightest undergraduate students to cardiovascular and health sciences. And so any undergraduate students who are here who would like to come up and talk to faculty afterwards, feel free to or to email afterwards if you don't want to talk right away. This is our 2017 Graduate Student Executive Council. So we have members here from all the different labs involved in the Center for Cardiovascular Investigations. And the students provide key input in decision making so that we can synergize our programs with their needs. They also help organize seminars and other events so they can start to learn leadership uh, roles and get some experience, which is really important for CVs and leadership in the future. And now we also have started the Undergraduate Student Executive Council as well, and so we'll need new undergraduates next year. If you're not in fourth year and you're interested, feel free to reach out and email uh, me. And so the basic idea is we can start to provide those leadership opportunities for the next generation that can go on your CVs as well. Okay, so now I'm going to invite up Alav Sandhu, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about Manulife Ride for Heart, which I just want to emphasize is really fun. It's not a race. I didn't do it for a couple of years because I was worried about racing. You don't have to race. A bunch of us go, and it's fun. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no, Hi, guys. So the Golf Party Vascular Center is back again this year with Heart and Stroke to offer you a unique experience on a traffic-free Gardner and DVP. I'll be inviting you to ride, run, or even walk on the Ride for Heart on June 3rd, 2018. It's a fun day, like Tammy said, it's not a race unless you want to, of course, and you can come do it with your family and friends. So if you're interested in being part of our team, supporting, or even learning more about this event, then please contact me at lsandu at uofguelph.ca. So now I have the pleasure of calling up Shara and Sherry, our CCBI student reps from Simpson and Funfara Labs, to say a few words. Um, on behalf of the Student Executive Council and members of the Simpson and Fonterra Labs, we welcome you to today's Center for Cardiovascular Investigations Cardiovascular Scientist Seminar. Just a few notes before we begin. A special thanks to all members of the Student Executive Council and our undergrad reps for helping to coordinate their labs for promoting this event. Please take photos, tweet photos, and use hashtags Wealth and CCVI Today, you are welcome to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Importantly, we ask that people uh, please remain for both speakers. We will hold questions until after both talks, at which point you're welcome to come down and ask any questions at the end. That way we can have both talks in the time permitted. And also thank you to Biomed, OVC, and CBS for sponsoring the pizza lunch for today's seminar. So we now have the honor of calling on Dr. Cheyenne Sharif, Department Chair of Pathobiology, to say a few words. First of all, I just wanted to welcome everyone to the CCDI seminar today. Um, then Dr. Tammy Martino, my colleague and friend, asked me to uh, provide the introductions. 
I, I emailed back and I said, Mark, uh, Sammy, are you sure that you want me for, for the talks? Because of the caliber of, of the talks and the, the sort of presenters you know, that have been historically coming to these talks and giving presentations, I was um, pleasantly surprised. And Tammy said, yeah, I think we need you for, for the conference. So it is indeed my great pleasure, my privilege and honor to be here among many of you as my friends, as my colleagues, and uh, some of you as our early career colleagues. So it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Also, I'm here uh, to introduce to you uh, the keynote speakers, Dr. Jeremy Simpson and Dr. Sonia Fanfora. I uh, just wanted to tell you that, um, as one of our students did allude to it, uh, there would be no questions, fortunately or unfortunately, in the middle. <laughs> so please save your questions for the very end, and hopefully there is going to be ample opportunity for questions. Uh, so without further ado, I'm just going to move forward and introduce to you the first keynote speaker, Dr. Jeremy Simpson. Dr. Jeremy Simpson has done his undergraduate degree in human biology at the University of Guelph, and he obtained his PhD from Queen's University in Physiology. Subsequent to that, he did two postdocs, the first at Queen's University, which was also followed by another postdoc at Dr. Peter Bax's laboratory at the University of Toronto. Dr. Simpson was recruited by the University of Guelph by Human Health and Nutritional Sciences in 2009, and he rose to the rank of associate professor in that department. He's been awarded several grants and prestigious awards, including a new investigator award from the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada. And his research has been continually uh, funded by the Heart and Stroke Foundation, NSER, CIHR, and also he's the recipient of the Canadian Lung Association grant. Uh, he is an expert on cardiorespiratory physiology. Uh, he's an expert on cardiorespiratory uh, physiology, and his seminar is entitled Cardiovascular and Respiratory Medicine, Pushing Paradigms to Improve Patient Outcomes. So without further ado, please join me to uh, thank Dr. Simpson for accepting the invitation to give a talk today. Thank you. All right, thanks very much today for the invitation to come and speak today and talk about something that I find really fascinating and some of the work that we've been doing over the past couple of years. But I thought before we start uh, discussing the data that I'm going to present, something else I want to talk to you about that's really important is the actual the people that do the work. I thought I'd start off my talk today showing you that the people that are in my lab, and I want to point to them because they're right there in the, uh, the last row there. Because today I get the, uh, the, the benefit of being able to present some of the cool data and the work that we're doing. But it's really because of these people. So I want to say first, thank you very much for coming to work with me. Because it's really the talent of these people and the work that they put in that we're able to do the work we're doing. And the things that I think are really exciting. Um, our lab has a slightly different approach to research. What we want to do is we want to look at heart disease from a, a whole body systems approach or an integrative approach. We know in heart disease that the heart is dysfunctional. But moving forward, what we want to be able to do is look at the other systems, not look at the heart in isolation. Look at the heart and how it interacts with adipocytes here. What kind of interaction are going there and how does that contribute to heart disease? Over here we're looking at hemoglobin and red blood cells. Some of the cool work that Laura is doing, along with Brittany and Melissa, looking at how red blood cells affect cardiac function and whole body physiology. Partially, we'll look at this organ down here, and, and just a shout out to the people over here. That's my next favorite organ. This is the uh, oddly looks thing. This is the spleen. Um, uh, unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it here today, but uh, Jason Huber, if you've ever come across Jason Huber, he will talk your ear off about the spleen. But we have some really cool data showing how the spleen is very important for cardiovascular physiology. And that's work that Jason's doing along with uh, Brittany Edgett. Um, some renal work we're doing, but today what I'm going to talk to you about is the interaction specifically in the heart between the respiratory system and the brain. So I want to first start with how do we classify people in heart failure? Um, 
we commonly will look at a figure like this and say, okay, it looks like he's out of breath or exhausted, or something going wrong here. But before we talk about heart failure, let's talk about classifying other diseases, COPD, uh, diabetes, cancer, stroke. How do we classify those? Typically, we use some sort of indice of function or dysfunction that's specific to that disease. So for COPD, we might use FEV1, diabetes, insulin levels, fasting glucose, cancer, we're going to look at tumor size, stroke, we're going to look at cognitive output. And so for heart disease, the way we classify patients is by looking at cardiac output and end diastolic function and indices of cardiac function. No, not really, do we? This is a standard way that we classify uh, heart failure patients. We have four different stages here, and what you look here, there's not one indice of cardiac function, not one parameter do we use. We classify them generally based upon dyspnea and exercise intolerance. So in the first stage here, mild, it's ordinary physical activity, doesn't cause dyspnea, fatigue, or palpitation. Really, that just means you have risk factors for heart disease, and when we look at all the risk factors, pretty much all of us are in stage one right now. It's a fun stage, so uh, welcome to stage one. We want to stay in stage one. Because we progress to stage two and three, what we see is an increase prevalence of dyspnea or exercise intolerance all the way to stage four. So what's peculiar about here is we don't evaluate cardiac function. We don't look at cardiac function to stage patients. One of the reasons for it is this slide here. So this is looking at peak oxygen consumption or an index of, of exercise capacity. And this is left ventricular ejection fraction or cardiac function. And what you see here is there's no correlation. We know patients with heart disease have exercise intolerance, but it's not solely to do to the cardiac dysfunction. There's something else going on. What we want to talk about is dyspnea and exercise intolerance. So with exercise, all of you guys at some point push yourself until you get exercise intolerance, so that sort of breathlessness. And if I ask you guys, how do you describe it, you all come up with slightly different terminology. There was a study done by uh, Dennis O'Donnell down at Queen's University, specifically with COPD patients. But he was tackling the same problem. So he went and asked a whole bunch of people how they classified dyspnea themselves. Took a whole list, and then in a group of patients that exercised to exhaustion and healthy, he asked them to circle what they thought best described. And most people said heaviness of breathing. I think we can all relate to that. If we push ourselves, we run too far, we feel a heaviness of breathing, that would be called dyspnea. But then he did it for the patients who had disease. In this case, it was COPD. They also described heaviness of breathing, but they also wrote in, can't get enough air in, showing us that there's a disease aspect of dyspnea. It's not always the same way that we're going to feel it in healthy states. And this is really important for heart disease because dyspnea and exercise intolerance is the reason patients stop exercise activity. Now, we've known that respiratory muscles have been involved in for decades. We know that we take a healthy heart, it develops heart failure over time, and somehow this respiratory system becomes dysfunctional. People have been publishing in both animal models and in patients that we have respiratory muscle dysfunction. What we didn't know was why. We just kind of looked at saying, well, it's a side effect of heart disease. If you have heart disease, you're going to have exercise intolerance. It was nothing we could do to treat it, nothing we could do to affect it. It was just a byproduct. How would it develop? Well, the current theory is that with heart failure, we get fluid buildup. And the fluid builds up in our lungs and it makes our lungs heavy. And that means our, heart, our respiratory system is going to have to work harder to breathe. And we're constantly going to work that respiratory system until it fails. Any system without uh, rest will eventually fail. You talk to any elite athlete, they know that the rest days are just as important as the days where they're doing their activity. You have to give your time or your body time. The idea here is that we put a load on, a fluid in the lungs, loads the respiratory muscles, and eventually would develop weakness. Why it develops, we're not really sure. So one of the key things that we see in patients who have heart failure is there's an increased respiratory drive. Just as right now as you're sitting there to breathe in, we can measure that and see how much pressure and how much work it takes. For heart failure patients, they're slightly elevated, a little bit more work. And you sit there and say, well, is that really a big deal? Well, maybe for one or two breaths, not a big deal. But this is something that's unrelenting. Going to go on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, sometimes decades. And that increased load, over time, we believe, caused impaired force production. And when people have looked into the muscles, they've looked into it and said, well, there's some calcium handling problems. Yeah, absolutely. Atrophy, we have identified atrophy, inflammation, and necrosis. There's a problem here. Don't disagree with all that. 
but it's how we've approached this whole situation. And I, I look at this as being analogous to showing up to a train wreck here. If I show up to a train wreck with a whole bunch of the people from the cardiovascular center and say, what do you think's going to go wrong here? Well, Tammy would look at this and say, not engine, it doesn't have the right rhythm. And it's that, that's what's wrong here. Glenn Powell, he'd be like, well, no, it's a linking problem going on here. Cromerant would say, well, no, there's a flow of the track problem here. I'd stand back and say, yeah, everything's going wrong. We know this, we can take a look at it. What do we need to do? We need to kind of uh, deconstruct this accident, back up the train, find out what's the first thing that happened. So if it turned out to be a wheel on the, uh, on the caboose was what was weak, we can go and fix that and even prevent the train wreck. So what we wanted to do is take a slightly different approach. We wanted to look at the evolution, not look at advanced stages, not look at end stage heart failure, but look at the progression, find out what was the first thing that went off the track and see if we can prevent it. So the first thing we need is a model. In this case, we're using a model of heart failure. The two typical ones is either having a heart attack or myocardial infarction or high blood pressure, you know, silent killer. These are uh, longitudinal and cross sections, uh, picker series red stain sections of the heart. It's normal histology, so healthy tissue is going to look yellow. And you're going to see here in the um, purplish looking color pink here. That's going to be fibrosis tissue. So you can see that this animal's had a big infarct or this animal has a thick wall. These are very stereotypical type models we're going to use. Now today I'm going to talk mostly about how high blood pressure leads to cardiac remodeling and respiratory remodeling. And what we know now, some of the work that Andrew finished up and that Shara my lab is doing, who spoke earlier today, is that this pathway also occurs, but very different. We can't simply say what we see in high blood pressure is the same thing for infarction, that different diseases of heart failure have different types of respiratory dysfunction. But we're going to talk about respiratory muscle function, we're going to talk a little bit about respiratory drive, how we drive the respiratory system, and mechanics. Usually when we're talking about mechanics, we're talking about lung function, how they work. So the first thing we need to do is develop a model and test to see if we can actually get uh, cardiac dysfunction. So here is a uh, nice schematic, uh, or uh, sorry, a picture of a heart and two kidneys. This was done by uh, Matthew Platt in my lab. I think this is really incredible to see it because it, it really kind of shows you the relative size of the heart to the kidneys. And it's not what you'd normally expect. But you can see coming off the heart here is the aortic arch and going all the way down the abdominal aura. Eventually it branches off of the kidneys. In this case, we put a constriction around the transverse aortic um, arch or the constriction. And that's going to reduce the size of the aorta. The heart's going to have to produce higher blood pressure, and over time, that's going to lead to specific remodeling changes. We can see a thicker wall of the left ventricle, and eventually we get dysfunction. We can measure that and come up with different ways. Here we're looking at left ventricular and diastolic pressure. We see it's elevated. Clear evidence that we have diastolic dysfunction. Heart's not relaxing well enough. We also look at systolic function. Common index is DPD max. We can see in these heart failure animals, they have reduced DPD max. They're not able to constrict that heart, produce this name normal force. And this was done after 18 weeks after implementation of TAC. So okay, so now we have our heart disease. And the question is, do we have respiratory muscle dysfunction? Well, we took the diaphragm and we again did histology on it. I really like histology because you really don't need to know what you're looking at to sit there and say, they look different. And that's a good thing to start off, that we did something different here. So this is a cross section of the diaphragm, so we're going from the abdominal to the thoracic uh, wall here, and you can see the individual fibers here. And the first thing that catches your eye is there's not a lot. It's kind of incredible. The amount of fibers that span the diaphragm amounts is only around 12 to 15. It's not a very thick muscle. But here in our 18 week tack, you can see that we get more red buildup, we got more fibrosis, and we look at the individual cells, they're much smaller. We can measure it by measuring the cross sectional area, and we can show that it's reduced. This is typical of what we expect to see. We got some sort of atrophy. So now the question is, do we have an increased drive? So we can measure respiratory drive by looking at the pressure generation here. And we can see that we do have an increased drive. So by 18 weeks, we have pretty much recapitulated what we see in patients and other people have published in animal models. You get overt heart failure, you're going to get respiratory muscle atrophy, weakness, and there's going to be an increased drive. So now how do we back that train up? We start looking at the progression. And so simply what we did, is we looked at various time points throughout the progression saying what is going on? How does this develop? So here's a summary of this progression. So we're going to put out here saying this is overt heart failure coming out 18 weeks. 
where at this point we've been able to show that we've got some diaphragm fiber type um, switching, some limb muscle atrophy, and back here in the diaphragm we also have diaphragm atrophy. This is what other things people have shown. We've now just separated and shown that this is a progressive disorder. We further went on to be able to look at and say, what's going on with the ability of the system to produce force? And in fact, we do have weakness here. The system's not able to produce the same amount of force. So we go back to what we see in, in patients and clinical populations. That's because there's an increased respiratory drive, that, drive that's weakening it, right? So we can look at it, saying, do we have an increased drive? And sure enough, we can measure that, and we can see by two weeks, our respiratory drive has gone up. They're working harder. Not a lot, but a very little bit each breath over time. So if our here theory holds, what we should look at is for having fluid in the lungs. And we should be able to find fluid in the lungs coming early on as the cause. And so then when we looked at the lung pathology, what we found, there was never fluid in the lungs. We didn't find at any time points that we had pulmonary edema. And this kind of aligns with patients. We think of heart failure patients having fluid in the lungs, but when we actually look at patients on an outpatient settings who are stable heart failure, very few of them actually have fluid in their lungs. They're not walking around with these heavy fluid lungs. And that's exactly what we find. We do find lung remodeling, a very specific type of lung remodeling. It's becoming a fibrotic lung, but it's not happening until nine weeks, well after we see the changes in the respiratory system. So where does that leave us? Well, right now we can say that high blood pressure, or using a model of TAC, induces heart failure, causes early diaphragm weakness. That is caused primarily by diaphragm atrophy. Atrophy is specific to the diaphragm. I didn't show you that, but if we look at other muscles, it's not all the limb muscles. So it's something happening specific to the respiratory muscle. And it occurs in the absence of pulmonary edema and precedes alterations in lung remodeling. So this started us down to figure out what is causing that increased drive. It wasn't something that we expected to see. Here's how we can measure it. We can look at our inspiratory pressure and we can see it's elevated. Here's a healthy animal. Each breath is going in a negative direction as they take an inspiration in. And by two weeks, our drive is going up. Um, the next slide here to show you is something that took us almost a year and a half to do. Uh, it, was, it was really challenging trying to figure out why was this drive going up. There was a number of theories from the literature why drive was going up, and we went through each one and found out it wasn't there. And once we went through one and found out it wasn't there, I'd come back and sit down with Andrew saying, oh, okay, I think it's this. And he's like, okay, I'll go try it. And he comes back and says, nope, data says you're wrong. Oh, all right, I think it's this. You go test the data and comes back and says, nope, you're wrong again. And after about a year and a half, we finally keyed into the mechanism of what was going on. And here's a short summary. It's uh, nice to be able to take a year and a half of work and put it into one little slide. Um, but what we're doing here is we're showing that respiratory drive is up in our vehicle treated animals, but then we've treated them with a number of ARBs. These are clinically available drugs we normally use to treat patients with heart disease. None of these ARBs had any effect, but this one did, candesard. We're gonna talk about more of that later. Then we can look at beta blockers, a normal drugs. These are common drugs, first line therapies we use to treat patients with high blood pressure. And most of these had no effect except for propranol and um, metropol tartrate. In the beginning, we couldn't kind of figure this out. Why were some having an effect and not others? And then it kind of dawned on us, the central unifying mechanism. These drugs that were effective are lipophilic. So that means that because they're lipophilic, they're able to pass through that blood-brain barrier and have an effect within the brain. Clinicians were aware that these drugs were lipophilic, but for the most part, they didn't care, except for the beta blockers. The lipophilic beta blockers, patients would normally sit there and saying it causes them to have dreams and nightmares, so they didn't like it. So for the beta blockers, propranolol isn't really a, a drug of the therapy of choice. Atenidol and carbidol, those are the main drugs we seem to be using. But when it came to the beta blockers, or sorry, the ARBs, we knew that there was differences in those drugs, but no one found a benefit from a cardiovascular perspective with treating one ARB versus the other. You'd have one study that come forward and say, yes, this ARB is better, and another study come forward saying, no, it's not. So the literature is very uh, conflicted. But the question is, now that we knew that these drugs were having an effect, what was our reasoning behind this? Is we know in heart failure, hormone dysregulation is a very characteristic feature. We have an increase in sympathetic drive, and this increased drive is what leads to change in the heart that causes heart failure. Our drugs here to try to block those increased drives and the effects on the heart. 
What we're able to show here is that some of these drugs that cross the blood-brain barrier work in the brain because now those same hormones that overdrive the heart are overdriving the respiratory system. And this is a novel thing. Until we came along, no one had ever shown that these hormones are able to drive respiration, independent of chemical drive. So why was this occurring? This sent us on another search. And we went and did an exhaustive um, search looking at why was an increased drive, this unrelenting increased drive, leading to muscle atrophy. So we looked at a number of pathways. We looked at apoptotic pathways, autophagy, protein degradation pathways, and what you can see is a lot of them are not changed, or in some cases they're down. Then we looked at pathways for regeneration repair, and we actually see some of them are elevated. So on a molecular level, this diaphragm was trying to regenerate, trying to adapt, but that signal wasn't getting through. Why was that? Well, that led us into the final uh, section here, where we looked at proteins involved in ER stress. ER stress is a situation where if you have too much proteins going on and being folded and you get misfolding of proteins, your body or your cells is a way of slowing down the number of proteins that are being translated. And one of the systems involved is right down here in PERC. XBP1 is also in their system. So upregulated those systems are telling us the cell is overstressed. And this would make sense that if we have an overstressed system and we're operating the proteins that are involved in shutting down protein translation, we would get one of atrophy. Now, PERC is upstream of a well-known EF2 alpha factor. And we're able to look at EF2 alpha and show that the total protein level is reduced, but the phosphorylation is up and that together the total pro or phosphorylation over total protein is really high and that is your inhibitory stimulus that is inhibiting protein um, translation so we now have our mechanism that this over uh, or over hormonal drive overdriving the respiratory muscles was stressing the diaphragm to the point that it wasn't able to keep up and we're now we're shutting down protein synthesis if we're not able to synthesize proteins as fast or as much we're going to lead to atrophy so in order to test this we came along and said well why don't we treat with two different drugs. Let's do a head-to-head -head comparison. Let's uh, take our four-week tack, compete it with, um, or sorry, treat it with propranol or atenol. Propranol, we knew, crossed the blood-brain barrier, and that would reduce our respiratory drive. Atenol was not effective crossing the blood-brain barrier. Importantly, when we looked at this treatment, cardiovascular, the animals were identical. There was no difference. Well, that's what we want clinically. We're using these drugs to target the cardiovascular system, and indeed, there was no difference in the outcome from a cardiovascular perspective. But we're interested in saying, what about the respiratory system? So here we're able to go in from these histology figures, measure the cross-sectional area, and we present it as these histograms. So this is a frequency distribution of the cross-sectional area. And in black here, you can see what a sham animal looked like, and an animal that was treated with propranol has almost identical. It means that there's no difference in cross-sectional area, there's no development of atrophy. But in the animals that were treated with atenol, you can see here the blue is shifted to a lower cross-sectional area. A lower cross-sectional area means we have smaller muscle fibers, which means we have atrophy. So here we'll be able to show that by selecting the right drug therapy, you can actually prevent the development of respiratory muscle dysfunction. So to summarize our whole system here, what we're showing here is that in hypertension, and high blood pressure, we overdrive the kidney, the neurohormonal system, and that has a very um, stereotypical effect on the heart, leading the heart to compensatory remodeling and eventually decompensatory remodeling. This side of this pathway is well known. Clinically, we always treat patients by blocking this pathway. We use beta blockers or ARBs to prevent this pathway or try to reduce it. What we're able to show here is that these hormones also worked unexpectedly in the brain. These hormones traveled to the brain overdrove the respiratory system. By overdriving the respiratory system, we increased PERC expression, increased EIF2 alpha phosphorylation that led to protein um, inhibition or preventing protein translation, eventually development of diaphragm atrophy, and that also contributed to diaphragm weakness. But what's important is right here, we've grouped the drugs differently. Some of the drugs in green, they're able to do both. They can both treat the cardiac event and the respiratory event. Where the drugs in red, can only treat the cardiac event because they don't cross the blood-brain barrier. And what's important, although you see a fair number of drugs here, these are the ones that are not prescribed very readily. So what's the impact of this? 
what we're trying to propose here is that therapeutics are readily available. We don't have to wait decades or years to develop a new therapy to try to treat respiratory weakness. All we have to do is pick the right drug for the right patient and we can now switch and block both the cardiac effect and the respiratory effect. Now, one of the controversies that if we look through the literature, people will, will do a drug-to-drug -drug comparison. Candesart and events uh, Losart. Which one's better? Which one's worse? And in, they're very typical type clinical studies. They're looking at the same output. Mortality. All-cause mortality. So now I propose to you is, is the only thing we worry about in life is how long we live? What about quality of life? In this case, we're not necessarily proposing that we're going to make people live longer, but we're improving quality of life by being able to target the respiratory system, alleviating that discomfort, that dyspnea that we feel, we're going to be able to exercise more. We're going to have greater exercise tolerance. That's going to lead to an improved capacity for um, rehabilitation. We know exercise is really good. A lot of people in my department look at how exercise therapy can benefit patients. The problem is heart failure patients have an impaired ability to exercise. But if we can prevent that or target it, we can improve quality of life and maybe down term we could have an improvement in mortality. So what we're right now trying to do is convince the cardiologists is to go back to the way we stage heart failure patients. If we stage them by dyspnea and exercise intolerance, when we have a new drug and we want to check it out, we shouldn't look at just all-cause mortality or cardiovascular events. We should also look at the impact on respiratory function. Currently right now we have a clinical study underway in Toronto. We're going to try and see if we can tease that out. Um, where else do I have impact? ARBs versus ARNI. Um, if you guys follow along the uh, news in the past couple of years, Novartis has come out with the newest blockbuster drug and that's called an ARNI. ARNI is an ARB with a neprilysis inhibitor. That's where you get the ARNI from. So it's an angiotensin receptor blocker with a neprilysis inhibitor. And they mix valsartan, which is a normal ARB, with their neprilysis inhibitor sacubitril. We've done some work with this, and we've looked at it, and we think we've made not the best choice. So by looking at this combination, we know that valsartan does not cross the blood-brain barrier, so it's not going to treat the respiratory function. Although this drug has had a lot of benefit right now, and the uh, new stats or the new um, clinical guidelines just came out last month for how we should treat patients, ARBs and our ARNIs are now considered one of the major drugs we should be using. We think we can make additional improvements. If we switch out valsartan for something like candesartan, we can now again tackle both the respiratory and the cardiac event. So are we done? Uh, somewhat. Because right now all I've shown you is that we're able to prevent the development. How many people here are going to get heart failure? None of you? You realize half of us are going to get heart failure. About half, 54%. So for the people that know you're going to get heart failure, you should be considering going on drugs now. Okay, so that's unrealistic. So that kind of shows the problem is that we showed that we could prevent the development of the disorder. What about treating it? Because that's really what we want to do clinically. When people are showing up and they have this respiratory dysfunction, can we treat it? So we've done a little bit of work with that. So we're looking at inst uh, installing our model, waiting for a while until we have development of atrophy, and then starting our treatment. Again, we're doing head-to-head -head comparison, just like what we do clinically. We're picking a uh, propanol against a tenol and saying which one is better. And when we look at the outcome here, we can see from a cardiac event, they're equivalent in terms of uh, blood pressure regulation. We can look at contractility as equivalent or ejection fraction. Cardiovascular wise, they're equivalent. We don't see a difference in left ventricle function. However, what's interesting is when we look at the development of atrophy. So these are cross section areas of the diaphragm. Here we just outline the cell uh, of the uh, wall of the heart with uh, wheat germ showing up here in green, so we can now measure our cross-sectional area. And we can generate these histograms, again, looking at the cross-section on the x-axis and the relative frequency distribution. Here we're comparing a uh, untreated attack to attack treated with a tenol. And a tenol, we say, doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, so it shouldn't treat the atrophy. And when we compare the cross-sectional area of the median, we see there's no difference. We weren't able to regress it. When we look at an animal treated with propranol, we now see that cross-section area has gone to a higher number. That means we have regressed it. We're actually treating it, which is what we want to be able to do. And what's interesting, we've looked at a few earlier time points, that if we look at only three weeks of treatment, we have no effect. Five weeks, we have a little bit of effect, but we need to treat for a certain amount of time before we have sufficient effect. But this is great that we've treated the atrophy. What we want to know is, are you better function? 
So we can look at the function, look at inspiratory pressures. How well can we generate inspiratory pressures? And in a healthy sham animal, they generate around 70. With instigation of TAC here, we can see a reduction of pressure. We got weakness of the system. That progresses even further in an untreated situation. When we treat with the tenol, we weren't able to treat with the atrophy and we weren't able to get any improvement here in function. But by treating with propranol instead, we're able to improve function and able to produce more respiratory pressure. So this is a good thing. This is what we want to be able to check, see if we do in a clinical perspective. So going back to here, say here, there's our situation here is we're saying that if we have two systems failing of one, if we start getting the cardiologist and respirologist working together, we think we can bridge a lot of the gaps and improve respiratory capacity, exercise intolerance, and quality of life. But I would say, is it just two systems filling as one? Mm, probably not, but I'll leave that for another time and tell you how the spleen is also playing a role in, in failing with this system. But I'd say in short summary here, while the foundations of clinically classifying heart failure are largely based on dyspnea and exercise intolerance, clinical trials are generally not designed to include measures of respiratory function as a primary outcome. This was surprising when we looked through the literature. People aren't looking at respiratory function. They really look at all-cause mortality. What we're trying to do is bridge that and saying that dyspnea and reduced exercise capacity are the chief complaint for patients with heart failure. It's often the reason they first start to see their doctor. Normally what they're saying to the doctor is like, I used to play golf and do 18 holes on the weekend, no problem. Now I get to six holes and I'm tired. What's going on? It's explaining exercise intolerance. So any improvements in respiratory muscle function will be a benefit to these patients. And if we can better bridge respiratory and cardiology to improve age, um, patient outcomes by including respiratory assessments in future clinical trials and drug trials. So I'd like to just finish it off and say thank you to our, our funding. We've uh, enjoyed funding from the uh, Lung Association. They were the first person that actually, our funding group that uh, funded my lab as a uh, new investigator. And they, it was the uh, start of the first study that we did. So I'm really thankful for them to help me along. Heart and Stroke Foundation has funded us along as Glyconet, CHR, and NSERT. And here I list uh, all the students that have helped my lab, which I'm truly grateful for. Um, specifically, Nadia Romanoff has done a lot of the work, Andrew Foster and Matthew Platt and Jason Huber. They are my surgical team that just go at these models and do a superb job. Shara and Sidra, Razan, uh, Jordan, uh, Dr. Brittany Edgett, uh, Torn, Scott, Ali, uh, Divya. Melissa Allwood, she's gone on to uh, start in medicine, but she did a lot of work in her lab. It's helped us along the way. Uh, we have Repon, Kayla, Melissa, Laura, and, and uh, Jillian. So I'm thankful for all the people that have helped me on this. And uh, I think now I will skip questions to the end, right? All right, so thanks very much for your time.